that we want our students back. We are doing everything that we can to align with all of the guidelines. Good afternoon and welcome to Washington Post Live. I'm Paige Winfield Cunningham, a health policy reporter here at The Post and author of the Health 202 newsletter. And today we're going to be talking about school reopenings and how teachers and administrators are preparing for a return to in the classroom learning. Uh, my first two guests today are Albany Superintend Superintendent Kawita Adams and Grant Rivera, who is the Marietta Schools Superintendent in Georgia. Thank you both for joining me today. Thank you. Thank you so much for having us. Superintendent Rivera, I want to start with you. I know that your district was one of the first to actually work with the Centers for Disease Control on a study to understand how the virus spreads within schools. What did that study find and what did you learn in the process of doing it? Yeah, thank you, and an honor to be with you, and certainly to join Superintendent Adams as well. Um, our CDC partnership that we had looked specifically at school-based transmission, and what we learned through that CDC partnership that occurred in December and January was that school-based transmission occurred most frequently between adults. Um, second to that was adults to children. What we saw less frequently as we looked at testing our students and really uh, doing very in-depth um, contact tracing was we saw much less frequency of student to student transmission. So that really very much informs how we re-engineer classrooms, how we change dynamics in schools, and most importantly, the implications for vaccinating adults who are in our buildings. I know that as you were going through this process with the CDC, you were expecting to see more transmission in high school and middle school classrooms, but the opposite happened. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, as a former high school principal, I think I imagined high school and middle school classrooms and hallways where students were transitioning and they're, they're sliding into math class and sitting near or you know in the same seat as someone previously from them in the previous class. And really that didn't happen at all. Uh, what we saw, we did see higher rates of transmission among athletics, particularly in our winter sports where they were indoors, uh, concerns regarding basketball, cheerleading, wrestling, what have you. What we didn't see was that type of spread occurring in our middle and high school um, hallways and in our cafeterias. Part of that page was because of, we had lower classroom density in our middle and high school classrooms. So therefore we had more children in our elementary schools. We had fewer children returning for in-person learning in our middle and high schools. But I think it was extremely informative. We simply didn't see the same rates of school-based transmission um, in our middle and high school classrooms. And again, part of that is because of the dynamics of a middle and high school classroom are different. Teachers may be in the front of the room, kids may be seated for 60 or 90 minutes. That's very different than an elementary classroom where my second grade daughter is in a classroom all day long mixing with other children. That simply doesn't happen with the same classroom dynamic at middle and high. And, and Superintendent Adams, I know that your schools, or I believe that your schools have been mostly virtual through the year. Can you walk us through your thinking on that and the data you used in making your decisions? So thank you very much, and I appreciate Paige being here, and Superintendent Rivera, thank you very much. Um, I have followed some of your work, so it's very nice to see you in, in virtual world as well. But what I want to say is uh, a number of things that we looked at with regard to the infection rate at the very beginning, especially in the fall, we looked at what those transmission rates were. We looked at our community. Uh, we did work with our county executive and our departments of health to see what are some of those things that we needed to make sure that we had to have in place. And I think one of the best things that we did, we did a phased in approach so that we could make sure that not only our students could acclimate to the protocols and procedures in place, but also our adults. And so at the beginning of the year, we looked at half day of instruction with our teachers all virtually for two weeks. And then the second half of the day we spent with professional development. So that professional development 
also looked at how to deliver virtual instruction blended learning opportunities for our students so that we could maximize that instructional piece. But one of the critical pieces that we needed to put into place was the social and emotional care of our children and well-being. And so we took that time to do that phased in entry. Our elementary students were five days a week cohorted in classrooms from the beginning of the school year. And then we started in November with looking at those, those other experiences for our students, be it sports, be it uh, music, art, CTE programs, our career and technical education programs, looking at how we can engage our students in clubs and activities, because we know that those things were missing virtually. And then this spring, what we are doing is we are phasing in our secondary students to in-person learning, where we have about 1,900 of our secondary students that are coming back. And we've done a phased in entry as well with them by grade level, so that by the 26th of April, which is the beginning of the fourth quarter, we'll have our secondary students in-person learning on a hybrid schedule based on those students who have selected in-person learning. And so we still have a significant portion of our population that has selected virtual learning. So we're accommodating the, the needs of both, both sets, whether it's in-person or virtual. Superintendent Adams, um, has your thinking about the risk of the virus in schools changed at all? I know that last summer, you know, we didn't know as much about the virus and how it spread. And then through the course of the past year, we've seen more research showing that schools aren't these hotspots that a lot of people had feared. We've seen confirmation from the CDC, as we've already mentioned. Has your own thinking changed about this? And has that influenced your school as you've thought about students being in person versus virtual? Administratively, our thinking has been pretty consistent in that we realize that once we put these procedures in place and that we are training our students and working with them on understanding why this is important, uh, we did a bit of education with regard to what COVID is. And, and so appealing to that, that sense of responsibility for self-health care, looking at hygiene, looking at wearing our masks, looking at being responsible and socially distanced, those are the things that we focus on with our students. And our students are very resilient. They understand the importance of what we need to do in order to lower the transmission. Our adults have been phenomenal. They understand the procedures that we have in place. They are encouraging our students each and every time. If you need to pull up your mask, we have hand washing uh, times that we have built into our schedule along with the hand sanitizer that our students have at their desks and things like that. And so I would say that as an administrative team, it's pretty consistent with what we thought and what we expected. And I do believe that our students have risen to those expectations of understanding what it is to abide by those protocols and make sure that we are keeping each other safe. But Superintendent Adams, I think I want to I want to press a little bit on that because this has been interesting. As you know, we've seen schools make decisions all along the spectrum. Some have opened, some have been virtual only, um, and there's been a lot of divided thinking on this. When you look back over the year, do you think it was the right decision to have a lot of students stay at home, given what we now know about students not being huge vectors for the virus? I think the safety and well-being of students is extremely important. And there's one thing that I will say. Parents have to be comfortable with what's happening, not just in our schools, but also in a worldwide pandemic. I have had a number of parents who have said, I understand that the schools have done everything that they can. However, we are in a worldwide pandemic and I still have reservations about sending my child to school. And that, that doesn't mean that they don't believe in or understand or support what we as schools are doing in terms of cleaning and sanitizing our buildings and making sure that we have protocols in place. It means that we are in a worldwide pandemic and we have to make sure that people are comfortable. And what I do believe in is the fact that as a school district, being able to meet the needs of our families and of our students to offer in-person learning and virtual learning is, is extremely important. Those are the things that we need to do. Superintendent uh, Rivera, I know that since November, your school has offered in-person learning uh, four days a week. 
Um, what are some of the safety precautions and protocols that you've put in place there? And also what led to the decision of doing that four days a week in person? Yes, and I'll go back just a little bit, Paige. We actually opened up our elementary schools four days a week in September, middle schools in October, and as a full school district, we brought our high schools on in November. So K-12, pre-K-12, um, as of November, we've been open four days a week across all grade levels. And for us, the logic around four days was really to acknowledge that teachers in some grade levels, more secondary, more middle and high than elementary, were having to juggle both in-person and virtual learning. And we made a commitment to our teachers that as you juggle this, because again, we were really, we, we, we didn't know back in August and September how we would potentially open up schools. And there were times where teachers had to do both. So I may have 10 kids on a screen and 10 kids in a classroom. We protected Fridays for teachers to collaborate, make sure that we were very careful about how we were maximizing the instructional time we have with children because we did lose 20% of it in a given week. And I think as we look back then, I will tell you, and I, I empathize greatly with Superintendent Adams, there were so many safety protocols and mitigation strategies we put in place back in September that were based on what we knew then. And candidly, we know a lot more now. And I think that's one of the most important lessons for me as a superintendent um, is that we have to acknowledge that as the science changes, so does our approach. And for us, just to give you an example, what I knew last September when we first opened up our elementary classrooms is that masks were important. We've had a mask mandate in our buildings um, since we opened in September. I also, though last September, thought that it was important to hire extra custodians to wipe down buildings and door handles and, and high touch services. Um, we also bought partitions so each children had a desk partition at their desk or table. And quite candidly, I know a lot more now sitting with you um, than I did last September. While the masks may be critical to our ability to open next school year, five days a week and offer in-person learning, I don't know that the desk shields are. We, 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 we know they don't hurt, but we're not really certain with an airborne virus how much they help. And we know now much more around whether or not it's worth us spending thousands upon thousands of dollars to have extra custodians in the building wiping down surfaces. And, and, and what I'm trying to be reflective on is to lean on uh, public health experts, epidemiologists, the CDC team that we partnered with to say, how do we follow the science and the data so therefore we're not throwing expensive high-tech solutions at what really is much more simple, which could be establishing more normalcy in a classroom with appropriate social distancing and masks. And maybe instead of fogging every night, maybe we're really being more intentional about when we have children use water and soap. So um, there's just a lot of conversations. And for us in Marietta, it's following the science, following the data, keeping our children safe, keeping our staff safe, but also inching closer and closer to some sense of normalcy. And quite candidly, if my child's learning how to read, I'm fine if it's with a mask. I just want her in class five days a week, and I want the appropriate safety protocols that we need to keep her safe and everyone else safe. Well, you're making me think of an article where we ran in the post recently about that very thing about how we're now discovering that the virus isn't transmitted via surfaces in the same way that we once thought. So we have learned indeed a lot about the virus in the past year. Superintendent Adams, as you look to the fall term, what are you envisioning for classrooms in your school? Is it going to be all in person? So our goal is to have our students back all in person. Our partnership with the CDC and with our New York State Department of Health, as well as our local uh, Albany County Department of Health is critical because we know that data is changing. We just received new guidance um, about a week ago with regard to here are the new changes with regard to social distancing. And so we are planning in that way to get our students back because we want our students back in person. We know that while there may be, have they, there have been people who have been successful with virtual learning, we also know that nothing takes the place of that face-to-face -face interaction between the teacher and the student. And so we want to make sure that those are the things that we are really focusing on, getting our students back in school and aligning with the protocols. I agree with Superintendent Rivera that we do know more now than what we did when we started this almost, what, 18 months ago. And so knowing that, we want to put those things in place. And so helping our students be successful is critical, but we need to have them present and we need to make sure that our guidelines are clear and that we are communicating with our families what those expectations are. 
What about this idea of kids being vaccinated? I know that some teachers unions have stressed that they want kids to be vaccinated, even though even after the teachers have been vaccinated first. We've heard that from some of our uh, unions in Northern Virginia. Uh, Superintendent Adams, what's your thought on that? Um, and, and also in light of the fact that the CDC has actually said healthy, healthy children are at less risk for complications from COVID-19 than from the seasonal flu. So we support the vaccinations. Um, about 70% of our faculty and staff have been vaccinated. We do, and that means a combination of they have received a first dose or they have completed their two doses. Uh, we do have partnerships with Whitney Young Health Center, with Albany Med. We also have partnered with pharmacies so that we can set up those uh, stations so that our students can get those vaccines, those students who are 16 and older. And so we're in the process of putting those things together. And so we do encourage that our students are vaccinated, that our faculty and staff are vaccinated, because we know based on the national information that is coming forward, that it does help reduce the spread of the virus. Superintendent Rivera, what about in your district? Have most of your teachers been able to get the vaccine? And then what do you think about this idea of requiring students uh, age 16 and above to get the vaccine? Is, is that something that you would mandate before they can come back to the classroom? Sure, so I'll react to the broader question around vaccinations. I, we as school leaders, and I think as community leaders have a responsibility to be a voice and a, and a partner with public health agencies. And Marietta, uh, we have been very proactive in partnering with local pharmacies like Superintendent Adams. We have hosted multiple events at our high school with our school nurses, with literally me as a superintendent in the parking lot, helping with the cars passing through. Like we've been hosting events for our staff, for their families. This past Sunday, uh, this past Friday and Sunday, we did over 800 students over the age of 16 and myriad of families. So we're taking a very active and, and progressive role in helping address the equity gap that exists in many communities. So for example, in our community where we have some segment of undocumented families, they may not wanna go to public health, but they will come to us. So I feel we have a very active role in helping our community and especially our students and staff get access to the vaccine. Now, with that said, you asked about percentages of staff. I think the decision to get vaccinated is a highly personal one. In Marietta, while we may ask if you've been vaccinated, if and when we're contact tracing, I don't believe it's our place to create a master list to know who has and who hasn't. We're encouraging everyone. We're making it easy. We're making it accessible. We're explaining the importance and how, again, because of that CDC partnership, we know that adults oftentimes may drive school-based transmission, but we're also acknowledging it's a personal decision. And then going to your second question, and I've watched with, with such curiosity around how post-secondary colleges and universities are requiring anybody to come back on campus to be vaccinated. And while you know, I have been vaccinated, I will want my children um, who are five and eight when it's appropriate to be vaccinated. I think, again, that is a highly personal decision. I do not foresee in the state of Georgia or with Marietta City Schools, much like any other vaccination that we would make it a requirement. Uh, what we will do though, is help build a bridge between equity and access. Um, in our community by always being a vehicle through which they could get vaccinated. But I do not foresee in our state or in our school district that being vaccinated would be a requirement. It's not something we've done with previous vaccinations and it isn't something that I foresee coming with COVID. Superintendent Adams, uh, I know you mentioned previously you, you believe in-person learning is optimal for students. So I want to ask you a related audience question from Stanley Eisenhammer from Illinois. And uh, this person writes, how will your district address catching up on student learning that may have been lost due to school closures? That's a great question. And thank you, Stanley, for bringing that to the forefront. One of the things that we're looking at here in our district is we're looking at rebuilding and accelerating learning as we move forward. So we are looking at some of the Sarissa money that is coming from the federal government and also the American Recovery Plan, those funds that are coming to look at how we can accelerate learning, build a stronger summer school program, some after school programs, looking at what tutoring looks like. We're also looking at departmentalization at the third fourth and fifth grade levels throughout the district next year. We're also looking at what are those things that we need to do instructionally to engage our students more so that they can reach their highest heights with regard to accelerating their learning through project-based learning, through hands-on activities, critical thinking, all of those particular pieces that we normally do 
how do we enhance that moving forward? And so we are really looking at building in um, strategically supports for our students. And I have to say, part of that accelerated learning is looking at the social emotional component and well-being of our children. Um, I agree with Superintendent Rivera with regard to this, the equity piece. We need to make sure that our students have equitable access to technology, equitable opportunities to their learning, and the fact that they may not be as far along as they would have been had they been in person in school. Those are the gaps in learning that we're going to look to close because that is, at its purest form, the most equitable thing that we can do as an educational institution. We have to look at the whole child and how we look at that equity and access and opportunity academically, socially, and emotionally. Well, and on that important issue of equity, I know some have raised concerns that, you know, when a school district offered only virtual learning, it was communities of color that disproportionately could have been hurt by that. If you look at wealthier families, perhaps they could have, um, you know, parents would have been able to work from home. Maybe they could have sent kids to private schools. Lower income families were probably affected disproportionately by that decision. Does that concern you at all as you, as you look over the past year that perhaps those inequities could have been uh, widened by virtual only schooling? COVID-19 has impacted all of our lives in so many different ways. There is no one that has been unimpacted by COVID-19. And so when we look at our students who have challenges, our students of color, our students who need those extra supports, COVID-19 simply magnified what we need to do to level that playing field and accelerate the learning for those students who are most at risk. And so absolutely do I think that uh, some of the things that we've had to put in place when we had most of our students virtual, that we needed to make home visits, socially distance, of course. Did we need to develop check-in lists of how we check in with those students who may not be engaging at the level that they should be engaging? All of those things that were necessary and required during that time, we don't want to lose that. We want to maintain that engagement of our students. We want our students to know that there's someone that you can contact. There's someone here who is looking out for you. And there are multiple people who are looking out for you and your success to make sure that you have what you need. One of the biggest things that we faced being a district of over 9,000 students was the digital divide. And so we started our process knowing that at the beginning, we did not have enough computers to be one-to-one. -one. So we made the conscious decision through our technology department, our assistant superintendent, Kent Baker, we made that decision to ensure that every household had a device. In making sure that every household had a device, then we had to work with our instructional side of the house to schedule activities and schedule our classes in a unique way so that if we were providing synchronous and asynchronous learning, families could then access that learning at different times. Then we were a part of our Smart Schools grant and we received that funding. So then we were able to start phasing in one-to-one -one computers with our students. We have a great community. Our community stepped up and started to purchase computers to give to our students so that they don't have to loan them out. They actually own those devices. And then one step further, not only do you have the device, but we partnered with our community, we partnered with different companies to ensure that our students had hotspots and access to the internet, because we know that that could be a challenge. One of the other things, we have a significant homeless population. We worked with our shelters to provide the Chromebooks for our shelters, as well as, home, as, well as the hotspots so that they can have connectivity as well. So when we talk about equity and we talk about students and communities of need, it is doing what we need to do at every step of the way to make sure that our students have the resources for equitable access and opportunities. Well, unfortunately, we're out of time, so we're going to have to leave things there. Uh, Kawita Adams and Grant Rivera, thanks so much for joining me today. It was a fascinating discussion. Thank you, Thank Thank you. you very much. We'll all be back with Jennifer Nuzzo and Emily Oster in just a few minutes. Please stay with us. Life is full of questions, and some of life's most vital questions are about health. People look to their healthcare providers for answers. 
Answers that can be found in a single drop of blood. Finding those answers can begin in the laboratory or even closer to the patient. Healthcare providers must trust these answers. Answers generated by intelligent devices, backed by science and producing powerful workflow efficiencies. Regardless of the challenges we face, together we are shaping the future of healthcare. A future full of answers for healthcare and for humanity. Hello, I'm Jean Meserve. Though we are still mid-pandemic, more and more students are heading back to school. Kids under 16 can't be vaccinated at this point, but masks, social distancing, hand washing, and good ventilation all help keep them safe, and so does testing. But there are many different tests and different protocols for using them. Here to sort of all of this out is Dr. Deepak Nath. He is president of Siemens Healthineers Laboratory Diagnostics. Dr. Nath, thanks so much for being with us. Jean, it's such a pleasure to be with you today. So testing takes time, testing takes money, everybody wants it to be effective. Is there one best way for schools to do this? Jean, schools have a number of options uh, for deploying testing within their districts or individual institutions. Uh, even compared to six months ago, there are now two new tools uh, to uh, test for active infections, and they're antigen-based tests, and they come in two flavors. Rapid tests, where a result can be uh, provided within 15 minutes without the need for specialized laboratory equipment, but needs to be done one at a time. Or more laboratory-based tests, where number of samples, uh, for example, of an entire school or school district can be collected, and those tests can be performed on specialized laboratory equipment um, with results reported in a matter of, um, of a couple of hours. So those are two options that schools have today for scaling up. Um, one school district, for example, uses uh, these rapid tests for, for, for kids to perform these tests at home before they arrive at a school, and they furnish those results to um, school officials upon, uh, upon coming uh, to the school. Uh, that's now, one model. I was going to say, are these tests different than the PCR tests, which I understand are the gold standard? Absolutely, these are. So PCR, as you'd correctly know, Gene, are the gold standard. Um, they're highly sensitive tests uh, that uh, really uh, are able to detect a uh, infection at early, relatively early stages. The drawback with PCR tests um, is that they require uh, specialized laboratory equipment. Uh, these tests take uh, multiple hours to perform. Uh, and there's only so many of them that can be done um, at an individual lab laboratory in any given day. So there are some drawbacks to PCR tests. Is there any clear advantage to doing either the antigen testing in a lab or the rapid antigen testing? There are two important tools that uh, the schools could use. On the one hand, uh, the advantage with the rapid test is that you can get a result within 15 minutes. These tests can be performed at home at an individual uh, level. Uh, and so there's clear merits to that. The disadvantage um, is that um, they're, you're reliant on an individual to perform the tests. And so there could be issues with the integrity of the sample and the integrity of the result. And secondly, that these tests are now have to be reported and the results reported in some manual fashion. Um, the laboratory tests have as an advantage that they are run by laboratory professionals. Uh, each sample is barcoded and you can process large numbers of these specimens uh, at any given time. So you can, it's in theory, uh, not actually in theory, in practice, you can perform the tests for an entire school district in a matter of hours, collect the samples in the morning and have the results by, uh, by midday. So do you think that all students should be tested or only students who are symptomatic? All students need to be tested, Gene, because asymptomatic spread is a significant factor for COVID-19, as we've learned. Uh, so it's important that both symptomatic and asymptomatic children be tested as part of a well-thought-through testing program. Uh, we've been talking about the students, but what about the teachers and staff? They've been prioritized for vaccination. Many of them have been inoculated. Can they let their guard down? 
The short answer, Gene, is the vaccines are an important step. In fact, one of the biggest steps that we've, uh, that we've made during this pandemic. However, this is a marathon and not a sprint. And it's important for educators in particular to be vigilant. And the most important reason is that kids are not going to be vaccinated by and large until the end of this year and younger kids into early part of next year. So teachers and educators need to be especially vigilant because they're dealing with um, with, with kids uh, who are uh, who are unvaccinated. Uh, however, um, getting vaccinated is an important step that all educators uh, can take. The second step they could take is to know their status. Um, the effectiveness of vaccines have yet to be established um, at an individual level, in particular, how long the immunity lasts, the duration of immunity. And it's important to take uh, blood tests that gauge the effectiveness of vaccines at an individual level. And that's an important step that educators could take in addition to um, implementing the product protocols that you mentioned earlier on with masking, dis social distancing, and of course, the implementation of testing in schools. We've heard a number of different estimates on when we're going to reach herd immunity. When will we know when we've reached herd immunity? Now, most experts estimate that it takes somewhere between 75 and 80 percent of the population uh, to be immune in order to reach herd immunity. And that immunity can be acquired either through vaccination or recovery post um, infection. Now, uh, what's important to know is that we need to have tools um, to establish that immunity is what are the markers uh, by which we judge immunity. Fortunately, we have such a tool. It's uh, an antibody test specifically a test that can report not only on whether there are antibodies present or not, but whether, uh, in fact, what the levels of those antibodies, and specifically antibodies that actually neutralize the virus. So those tests are available, and we are doing work now with C as Siemens Health and Ears in a pioneering collaboration with the CDC to do two things. One, to create a common reference method so that results from tests made by different manufacturers can be compared. So when you get a result from one manufacturer about a certain level, that number can be compared to tests performed on uh, other manufacturers' uh, instruments or, or, or tests. The second is working with the CDC to establish a threshold for immunity. What is the concentration or the level of neutralizing antibody in blood that confers immunity? And to measure that, is a set of scientific experiments that will help establish that threshold and we're in the throes of doing that. Dr. Deepak Nath, thanks so much for joining us today to help sort this out. Uh, he is president of Siemens Health and Ears Laboratory Diagnostics. I will now hand it back to the Washington Post. Jean, thank you for having me. We have increasing large amounts of data showing that schools have reopened safely. We have detailed contact tracing data showing that we're not seeing spread in schools when they are open. And so there's a lot of really reassuring information that I think parents can look to when thinking about returning their kids to school. Welcome back. If you're just joining us, I'm Paige Winfield Cunningham, a health policy reporter here at the Washington Post. And my next guests this afternoon are Jennifer Nuzzo, a senior scholar at the Johns Hopkins Center for Health Security, and Emily Oster, professor of economics at Brown University. Thank you both for being here and welcome to Washington Post Live. Thanks for having me. Thank you. Emily, I want to start with you first, and I've really enjoyed your insights throughout this pandemic. I know we've spoken a number of times, uh, and you created this dashboard with data collected from schools across the country to try to track what was happening with the virus in schools. Uh, before we get into some of the findings, can you tell us what inspired you to create the dashboard and how many schools are you tracking with it? In the summer, uh, schools started to open in the US and I think we were inspired, and it's not just me, but there are a bunch of partners on this as, as well. We were inspired to try to get some information. I think if we think back to the summer, it was really unclear when schools opened, not only
by like large outbreaks in um, in schools. And uh, and so we started collecting data to try to get even a very basic sense of how much COVID were there was there in in schools and to try to do some systematic tracking. And the the current dashboard has um, covers about 12 million students of whom about 7 million of them are, are are in person. So it's a it's a very large effort. At this point, it started, of course, much smaller. What what conclusions have you drawn about the spread of the, the virus in schools based on the data you've collected? I think what we're seeing in the in the dashboard is that COVID in schools is really tracking uh, COVID in the communities. And much of what we see looks like evidence that uh, people are becoming infected outside of schools, and then some of them come to school. So when we see COVID rates go up in a community, we will see COVID rates go up among people affiliated with schools, but we are not seeing schools, for the most part, outpace their communities. And students in particular are significantly lower risk than the community on average. So the, the overall picture of the data is a picture of schools not being significant sources of COVID spread, uh, and not being significant sources of infection uh, for students or staff. And I think that's consistent with a lot of other data that we've seen outside of outside of the dashboard in smaller but more carefully curated samples. As we talked in the first segment, we've seen quite the range of responses from schools. Uh, two thirds of districts mostly opened up, one third of districts offered virtual only learning. Jennifer, as you reflect back on this year, what do you think schools got right and what did they get wrong? Well, I think part of the, you know, consideration is at what point were the decisions being made. And I think in the beginning, although I was quite worried about the prospect of closing schools for the reasons we now see, we're a year later and still many are not open, um, you know, I think districts really struggled with that decision and 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 did close it. I, I think they also didn't really plan for the long term uh, nature of this threat, you know, uh, was something that I think people sort of assumed would be done in a few weeks and then they could go back. Um, so that has certainly been a challenge. I also think that um, there hasn't been a lot of, unfortunately, creativity in trying to meet the needs of educating students while still minimizing the risk of transmission in school buildings. And so this is probably the reason why we see a number of places still not back and many places that are back are only doing so a couple of days a week. We never really saw schools uh, system sort of marshal additional buildings to educate students if they wanted to continue to spread them out before we knew that that probably wasn't necessary. We never really saw them, um, you know, think of alternative ways of, of transporting students. It seems like part of the problem with, with school systems is that they they absolutely need to be standardized across the entire system. And unfortunately, that really limits the options in terms of bringing students back. And, you know, in my views, I think students really suffered from that. Well, and to your point, you know, we've been learning and we've said this already many times, we've been learning about what the virus does and doesn't do over the course of the year. And we've learned that at different points. But what I'm wondering is, you know, is, is it more the fault of public health officials for not communicating what we're learning quickly enough? Or is it the fault of schools for not uh, not, you know, putting making their practices stem from those updated uh, understandings. I mean, I'm thinking, of course, of uh, most obviously the CDC's guidance on the desks being six feet apart, and then they revised it down to three feet. If we had had three feet of guidance at the beginning of the year, we could have seen a lot more students in the classrooms. Uh, so where have we seen the shortcomings here? Yeah, I mean, I think you've seen adapting guidelines and, you know, I, I think that's unfortunately going to be par for the course. We would like, uh, you know, guidelines to be um, much more dynamic, but there are processes and I think there is has been when it comes to kids a, you know, desire to be conservative. Um, that said, you know, I, I think some of the challenge has been um, where uh, the evidence was uh, was accumulating and it took longer than it probably should have um, for us to acknowledge that, you know, we really weren't seeing things in schools and that should have given us confidence or at least given us enough confidence to proceed until until we saw otherwise. I think that was a real challenge. I also think that um, where uh, public health authorities, and this isn't really up to them, I think it was more on the political leaders, you know, there were many points where decisions were made in communities that we're at odds with the goals of bringing children back to school. So, for instance, um, you know, governors or um, leaders of you know counties or cities would make decisions to reopen other venues that we know have been linked to higher risk of transmission and and increasing case 
case numbers in the surrounding communities that have then set back timetables to return students to school. And, and that's really where I see the shortcoming. It, it wasn't so much about the guidance. It was about the lack of prioritization of schools as the first thing we needed to open and the last thing that we needed to close. Even today, that's still not the issue. I, I live in Anne Arundel County, uh, Maryland, and our restaurants and bars are fully open with no capacity restrictions, um, but our schools are only uh, in, in person two days a week and our libraries have occupancy restrictions. We've you know, continually not prioritized the institutions that serve children and, and have um, elevated, unfortunately, the things that make it harder to return children to schools. Of course, President Biden has emphasized getting students back in the classroom, and he said he wanted the majority of schools reopened within his first 100 days. Emily, have you been tracking with that? Have we seen schools come in line and how close is Biden to accomplishing that goal? So I think that goal was almost accomplished before we began, because one of the things that I think a lot of this discussion misses is that the, there are many places in the U.S. where schools have been open full time in person in a largely traditional manner, more or less since September. So I live in Providence, Rhode Island. The, many of the schools in Rhode Island have been open this whole year. Uh, and that's unusual for the kind of political bent of the, the state that I live in. But in uh, you know North Dakota, West Virginia, Texas, Florida, many, many places we have had open, open schools. In addition, beyond that, over the last 100 days, we have seen a huge amount of additional reopening. So there are a number of different trackers, uh, the Burbio tracker, the AEI Return to Learn tracker, and they're all showing the same thing, which is students continuing to return uh, from virtual into hybrid or hybrid into traditional. So more schools are opening. Uh, we are seeing resistance in some places. California is a notable exception where uh, the districts have been much slower to return. But we are seeing more return, uh, which is great. Of course, as we come up to the to the end of the school year, um, we're going to have to start thinking about uh, hopefully making the fall look much more normal, much more like a like a traditional five day a week in person for all students. Jennifer, do you think that teachers should be required to get the vaccine before they return to the classroom? I know there's a lot of dispute about this because the vaccines only have emergency use approval. And and then what about kids 16 and over who are, of course, eligible to get the Pfizer shot? Yeah, so I think this is a really complicated issue, a bit more complicated than it may seem. I mean, I will tell you as a general rule in public health, we really um, try to use restrictions and requirements as a last resort. Um, so it would be my hope that our first um, encouragement is for the voluntary uptake of these vaccines for the purpose of, you know, it, it is understandable, um, although I absolutely believe in the safety and efficacy of these vaccines, they are not fully approved by the FDA. They are, have received a, a different um, designation, emergency use authorization. Um, that does not raise quality or safety concerns in, in my mind, but nonetheless, um, I, I think we, it means that we have more work to do to educate people uh, about the vaccines and, and the benefits to them. So it is my hope that that will be the approach that people will see these vaccines for what they are, um, important tools that we can use to protect ourselves. That said, I fully expect that um, many uh, congregate settings like schools and businesses will start to require um, their staff uh, to be vaccinated. As for kids, it's a much trickier situation in part because kids have largely been spared the worst outcomes from COVID-19. Serious um, complications from COVID-19 is incredibly rare in children. And so the risk benefit calculations are different. We don't yet have a vaccine for children under the age of 16, though I would imagine in the coming months that we will at least have um, one option uh, to vaccinate children. Um, but I think the, the push to vaccinate kids is, is um, a different and should be considered differently than the push to vaccinate adults simply because um, children haven't been as harmed by this virus um, as others. If the vaccine were available, I would absolutely sign my children up to be vaccinated because I believe that they are safe and um, having added insurance is, is helpful, but I can imagine a number of parents not feeling as comfortable. And so I think it's going to be a difficult road for schools to require it um, while the vaccines are not fully um, approved and for, for until we have, I think, more longer term data. We do require kids to be vaccinated before they go 
to school um, for a number of uh, diseases and conditions. But this is different. This is newer. The vaccines are newer. And I think we have to recognize that people's level of comfort with this just may not be the same as for these tried and true vaccines that we've had for years and years. I think we have to allow people to go through that educational process and see friends and family um, receiving it before we automatically respond with um, requirements. Assuming that the teachers mostly are vaccinated in the fall, is there any reason why learning shouldn't look basically normal uh, next fall? And Jennifer, I want to ask you this, and especially, um, you know, thinking about the risk to kids. Sometimes I wonder if people are really understanding the risk. You know, as I mentioned earlier, the CDC has said that the risk of complications for kids is actually worse for the seasonal flu than for COVID-19. And yet we have seen some teachers say they don't want to go back in the classroom until the kids are vaccinated, too. Is there any reason for that? Um, no, I mean, I will say from a scientific reason and an epidemiologic reason, no. I fully expect that our case numbers are going to continue to fall over the summer. Um, we're plateauing right now in part because we have been um, vaccinating up until now, largely the oldest Americans. As we expand vaccines, uh, and vaccination um, eligibility, which just happened this week, to include other age groups, I expect that the case numbers will continue to fall. And that in and of itself will be even more protective for kids and protective for uh, people in school settings, in addition to all the other safety protocols that have been put into place and, and, and recommended. So um, there will not be, in, in my view, um, an epidemiologic, a public health reason to keep kids out of school. I think though, um, the, the, there is still a problem if teachers do not feel comfortable being there. In my view, as a parent, that's a problem. And I think we need to do more to increase that comfort. Because while I can say, listen, I feel fully comfortable sending my child to school and really, really hope that uh, his school will allow him to go full time um, in the fall, I know that it won't be a, a positive experience if his teachers feel that they're there under duress. So we need to do the hard work to make sure that teachers feel comfortable with the situation situation um, because you know the magic of teaching is going to require their their them to be there with a happy heart I think we can get there I think it will feel much different by the time the fall comes around such that some of those uh, fears will be mitigated but um, the the public health um, rationale for bringing uh, kids back to school is absolutely there it's there now and it will absolutely be there in the fall Emily, I know you and I have talked about risk quite a lot and how people aren't great at measuring it all the time and assessing the probability of what might happen. How would you advise schools and parents to think about the risks as they're making these decisions? So I think one piece of this is just trying to make sure people understand sort of numerically how all these risks come together. And so sometimes I'll talk about what we're seeing in the dashboard, you know, what are the actual share of people in school? And I'll tell people, you know, in a, in a typical biweekly period, we're seeing, you know, two cases in, in teachers among a staff of a thousand over the whole, you know, the whole two weeks. And people will say, wow, like I had, I had no idea. I thought it would be, you know, 300 in every thousand that would be infected. And this was sort of er early on, but I think even now it's, very difficult for people to understand the idea of these small probabilities. So the more we can give them context for thinking about those risks and put them inside the space of maybe risks that they're already taking or risks that they really understand. So I like, you know, you come back a lot, Paige, to the flu example. I think that's that's a good example. But I think even beyond talking about the rates of complications, we can also talk about the risks. We can say, you know, every year, this is the number of kids in our school that would typically get the seasonal flu. And you know, this is the number of kids we would expect to get COVID. And those numbers aren't necessarily going to be, uh, be the same. Or we can talk about car accidents. We can talk about other kinds of risks that may be more familiar to people. And that's a way to start some of these steps that I think really get to what Jennifer is, is saying towards people feeling comfortable adapting to the idea of returning to some semblancy of normalcy in school, but also in other areas, while accepting that we will not be doing so in a space of zero COVID. And sometimes these conversations veer into, well, let's not do any of that until we're sure no one will ever have COVID. We are a long, many decades probably from nobody ever having COVID. What we can get to, I think, soon and certainly by the fall is a place in which 
people who are at high risk are fully vaccinated, when the case rates are much lower, when we should be comfortable adapting to this. But we're going to need to help everybody take those steps to feel comfortable doing this, uh, especially those who will be uh, in the classroom, where I think that there's been a lot of fear generated by the last year. Jennifer, you wrote a piece last month basically saying it's not enough to just have vaccines for everyone, but that we also need to have rapid tests. Why do you think routine testing is critical for schools to stay open? Well, I mean, I, I think routine, I mean, we should have availability of testing and ease of, of access to testing in the community uh, writ large. And really, when we wrote that piece, it was following the observation that testing has uh, largely fallen off since we have started rolling out vaccine in a way that I can't just tie to falling infections. It was it, testing in this country started to plateau before the U.S. even head into its uh, uh, peak uh, coronavirus incidence. So. Um, so the fall off in testing is is clearly worrisome. I think having testing available to schools is important. I don't necessarily imagine a situation in which kids are going to be swabbed, you know, every day or multiple times a week to show up at school. I think we're starting to see from some school districts that have uh, use those approaches. It's uh, a little bit problematic given the, the low probability of infection in children. Um, but certainly, if there are symptomatic kids, having red, rapid access to testing is really helpful. If there are outbreaks in schools, being able to test um, in order to understand how and if the virus is spreading within schools is really helpful. And I think some places that have done um, more surveillance type testing, trying to just understand are there um, pockets of infection that are occurring that are just not surveillance surfacing. Um, you know, New York City, I think, has employed this. It has been helpful in order to reassure people uh, that there isn't some looming problem that hasn't uh, yet been recognized. And so I, I want to make sure that those resources are available to school districts to be able to use. That said, I don't think that full on regular uh, testing, particularly of kids without symptoms, is a prerequisite for going back to school. And in fact, it may cause more problems than it solves. Um, but schools all schools, uh, you know, should have access to testing resources as needed um, and, and not have, uh, you know, cost or access be uh, put at that out of reach. Emily, you also wrote a piece last month in The Atlantic where you argued that vaccinated parents shouldn't hesitate to go on vacation with their unvaccinated children. And you pointed out that being a kid is 99.9% .9 protective against the risk of death from COVID-19. Uh, yet you got a ton of pushback from this article and sort of blown up on Twitter. Why do you think that is? I mean, I think there were there were a few things. I think one piece was that uh, that the headline of that article uh, made it seem like the that children were also substantially less likely to be infected, and that's not really as true. So the kids can get COVID, they get it at lower rates, but not anything like a ninety nine point nine percent reduction, which is what we're seeing for the relative rates of serious illness and death. So it's not that kids don't get COVID; it's much more that they are not likely to get very sick. I also think we're in a we're in a moment where um, where there is a lot of continued concern as we ramp up vaccinations, as we get we try to get to a place of more herd immunity. There's a, a lot of worry about getting ahead of our skis. And although I was talking about the summer, I think people were very concerned that, you know, we might read this as talking about now and saying it's fine to do whatever with unvaccinated people now, um, which isn't what I intended. But as you know about Twitter, it is difficult to communicate your nuance in 280 characters. Well, unfortunately- Can I just chime in on? Oh, I was just going yeah, to say, absolutely. I, I agreed, Emily, with your argument. Um, I think uh, some of the critics didn't fully read what you were arguing. And I think, you know, um, painting a realistic picture for parents who are now hopefully vaccinated, their kids aren't, and they're wondering what to do, I think is important to say that we do have some um, added freedoms and that's what vaccines give us. I totally agree, well, thank you, Jen. Unfortunately, we're out of time, but thank you so much to both of you for joining us. As a mom of three kids, I found this topic very uh, important and interesting, paid a lot of attention to it over the past year. So thank you so much for joining us with your candid insights. Thank you, Paige. Thanks so much. As always, thanks so much for watching and joining us today. I'm Paige Winfield Cunningham.